Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. On a hot, sticky night in late August, hundreds gathered on the South Lawn of the White House as President Donald Trump made his case for a second term. I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. The Republican National Convention was sort of an opportunity that Trump and, and some of his aides saw to tout what the administration had done on coronavirus, but to also present it as something that the country was mostly through, when that's not the case. And when I'm reelected, the best is yet to come. You know, it looked like split screens. You know, there's the world that a lot of us are living in where we're still mostly trying to stay in our homes if we can, wear masks when we go out in public. And then on TV, you saw a convention where 1,500 people are sitting on the lawn at the White House. Very few of them are wearing masks, and they're talking about a, a pandemic in the past. COVID-19 had claimed another 1,100 American lives that day, but the mood that night was celebratory, and the president's tone triumphant. We will defeat the virus, end the pandemic, and emerge stronger than ever before. No, no president has faced what we are going through at this time. I mean, no president has faced uh, in 100 years a pandemic of the size of the coronavirus pandemic. But I think most presidents approach these not with the idea of well, what's going to help me politically. It's how do we deal with this? How do we solve this problem? Um, we'll let the politics take its own course. But this also has happened in an election year. And we know that this president has been focused from the day he was elected on making sure he does everything possible to get reelected. A week before Donald Trump took office, Obama officials prepared a briefing for the incoming president's top aides, a rundown of the threats the new administration might face. So it's terrorism, it's cybersecurity, it's bioterrorism, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's those kinds of things. But one of the pieces that was put specifically into this was a pandemic exactly of the type that the coronavirus pandemic turned out to be. A brand new virus that nobody had ever seen before and for which a vaccine would be far into the future. I participated in the transition exercise part of which had to do with pandemic. And I think the incoming team didn't really want to take any of that very seriously. Some people did, but a, a lot didn't. Nobody knew there'd be a pandemic or an epidemic of this proportion. Nobody's ever seen anything like this before. This came out of nowhere. But it's an unforeseen problem, not a problem. Came out of nowhere. President Trump has said over and over, nobody saw this coming, we couldn't have been prepared. If you look closely at statements his own health officials were making, Secretary Azar was asked, what keeps you up at night? And he said a pandemic flu event. We lost 80,000 Americans just last year from the annual flu. I mean, imagine pandemic. And if you look back at statements from previous presidents, they all say it's not a matter of if, but when. Diseases know no boundaries. They threaten us all. At some point, we are likely to face another pandemic. There may and likely will come a time in which we have both an airborne disease that is deadly. But Trump came into office with other priorities. And in 2018, like Obama and Bush before, he disbanded the National Security Council's Office on Global Health. Over the last year, we have made incredible progress and achieved extraordinary success. I was within the administration when staff changes were made to what's been called pandemic response team or pandemic preparedness team. Frankly, it was a matter of who reports to whom. As long as there are people that are able to understand where expertise rests within the federal government and be able to convene those people, that becomes the most important part. But there are a lot of people who pointed out that if that unit had been in place as soon as coronavirus hit, it would have been clear that the National Security Council should take the lead and that this would have been run out of the White House right away. Sure, it's a mistake, but it's, a, it's hindsight. Was it the right decision? No. 
It was the wrong decision. But every every one of the presidents, you know, I mean, Republicans and Democrats have, have made the same mistake, but they have rectified it. A dangerous virus is spreading rapidly in China, and U.S. officials are very worried that it could come here. Chinese officials are racing to contain a quickly spreading virus that has now killed at least 17 people, infected hundreds more, and spread to several other countries. We begin tonight with the growing concern as the toll from that deadly coronavirus now grows, spreading from Wuhan In December China. 2019, disturbing reports began to emerge from China of a novel respiratory illness. Chinese announced in early January that the source was a coronavirus, and by the 9th, they had published the entire sequence on international platforms. A critical step because it meant that every country on this planet had the genomic sequence to this virus and could begin taking steps to develop diagnostics as well as vaccines. Um, an extraordinary rapid uh, evolution. What we saw from the United States government, though, was a dismissiveness. We have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. We know that the first formal notification to Trump, or at least the first formal notification that we know of, came when Secretary Azar called the president on January 18th. The president was at Mar-a-Lago that weekend. Um, and he calls the president and tells him, you know, there's this coronavirus circulating in China. Do you remember SARS and MERS? It was pretty clear in that phone call that the president was not interested in what the secretary had to say. He told a confidant that Trump dismissed him as alarmist and he wasn't sure how to break through. As of today, the CDC has reported five cases of the novel coronavirus infection here in the United States. I saw Secretary Azar be very concerned. I mean, he was tracking it. He was trying to figure out how we would get access on the ground. Dr. Redfield was part of these conversations. So we were already convening at a pretty senior level. I covered it from the perspective of the vice president's office. I was the lead staffer for him on this effort, so I attended meetings. I remember there was one specific meeting where it was looking like the virus was spreading at a very rapid rate, and that started to alarm us. But inside the White House, the main concern was an unfinished trade deal with China. That goes in line with the president's platform of, of trade and jobs and the economy. Those were his strongest points and things that he, he was very proud of uh, during his presidency. So of course, they were not going to rock the boat on this. The number of known infections across Asia has more than quadrupled. Alerts, the notices are blaring. And people in our government are hearing them people on the disease side, people at CDC, people at HHS, but they can't get the president's attention. But now we know from Bob Woodward's book that there was a, an intelligence briefing on January 28th where Trump's national security advisors tell him in no uncertain terms that this could be the biggest crisis of his presidency. It goes, it goes through air, Bob. That's always tougher than the touch. You know, the touch, you don't have to touch things, right? But the air, you just breathe the air. That's how it's... Uh... Past. He knew the severity of it. You know, he asked the right questions early on. He said, you know, how, how bad is this? How does this compare to the flu? How does it spread? I saw a man who normally I have seen in various situations sometimes act irrationally or say things publicly, but in that moment he was serious. And it was clear that he was a little bit taken back about what he was hearing. I'm Alex Azar, Secretary of Health and Human Services and Chairman of the President's Task Force on the Novel Coronavirus. In late January, the White House created a coronavirus task force and imposed travel restrictions on China. Later, they would be extended to Europe, but the virus had already arrived. When you have a pandemic that involves multiple countries, travel restrictions become almost irrelevant because you can't keep out the entire world. We had to recognize that this was just buying us a little bit of time, that it was not going to be a, a final solution to averting you know, the epidemic in the United States. This is a test Among the first officials to publicly sound the alarm was Nancy Messonnier from the CDC. We can and should be prepared for this new virus to gain a foothold in the U.S. She said, she sat her children down that morning. She told them life in the U.S. is going to change substantially. And I think the context that's important to, to understand at this time is 
still most of the country did not see this as a really serious threat. I mean, we were all going to work, we were living our lives as normal. It's not so much a question of if this will happen anymore, but rather more a que of question of exactly when this will happen and how many people in this country will have severe illness. We will make the stock market tanked after Dr. Messonnier's warning. They certainly did everything they could to prevent her from speaking publicly in the future. She was sidelined in the response, and uh, the signal went out to the bureaucracy. If you raise alarms about this, you're going to be pushed to the side and ignored. And look at that right there, Wall Street ending one of the worst weeks of trading since the financial crisis in 2008. I remember a lot of people gathered around the TV and watching the stock market drop. And it was at that time where I know the White House was very concerned about controlling what people were saying about it. Because of all we've done, the risk to the American people remains very low. That is when you see Vice President Pence get tapped to lead the task force. They felt that they needed someone credible, someone to lead inside the White House, but also someone that they could rely on and trust to stay in line with their messaging. I, I think, if, if I could just clarify, I think you're not getting the point here of this. I'm still chairman of the task force. Having the vice president gives me the biggest stick one could have in the government on this whole government approach. So you don't so, feel like you're being replaced. Not in the least. I'm, I, I, when, the, when, when this was mentioned to me, I said I was delighted that I get to have the vice president helping in this way. Delighted. Absolutely. The question of who should lead the task force, obviously the president immediately appointed the secretary of health to do that. I think he then came to the conclusion, I need to be clear that this is a full government response. And if I've appointed one cabinet member uh, to oversee the task force, that might not look like a full government response. No one's quite sure who's in charge, or four people seem like they're in charge. And the important thing to note about leadership changes is while it might not seem like a big deal, you lose some time every time someone else is put in charge of the response. At a point in moment when we knew that an event like this was going to demand extraordinary services from our health practitioners, that we knew that the need for personal protective equipment, the need for diagnostics were going to be the difference between success or failure, um, the United States government largely did nothing. If a pandemic is coming and we are disregarding scientific evidence and relying on tweets and a, an emergency supplemental without details and we're not stockpiling those things right now that we know we might possibly need for this or for any future pandemic, I'm deeply concerned that we are way behind the eight ball on this. The U.S. saw its first major outbreak in late February at a nursing home near Seattle. Teddy Tyler lost his mother on March 6th. And there was one point where she said, are you going to just let me die here? And I said, no, Mom. I said, no, of course not. But I could tell she was very scared and serious about that. I've talked to the owner of the funeral home, and they're just overwhelmed with not ready for all this to happen like, you know, nobody is. And, and, uh, and there's been a lot of people dying from this. All the while, President Trump and his allies would insist the crisis was overblown. The pandemic was just more political theater. The reason you're paying so, you're saying so much attention to it today is that they think this is going to be what brings down the president. That's what this is all about. They tried the impeachment hoax. That was on a perfect conversation. They tried anything. They tried it over and over. They've been doing it since you got in. It's all turning. They lost. It's all turning. Think of it. Think of it. And this is their new hoax. The president could be just as dismissive in meetings with his coronavirus task force. I think the frustrating part, and sometimes shocking, was the comments that the president would say. The comments about, you know, maybe COVID is a good thing. I don't have to shake hands with these disgusting people. Some people chuckled about it. I saw other people have a similar reaction to me, where either their eyes were a little bit wide, or they looked away, or they shifted their gaze to down at the table in front of them, or looked at the floor. I don't know how you say that out loud, knowing that people are hurting, and the hurt that is yet to come 
With each passing day, the spread of the virus was accelerating, but a lack of testing made it nearly impossible to track. Centers for Disease Control took steps to develop a diagnostic, but in a way that is unprecedented, failed. And the failure to produce a diagnostic is just historic. But there was no um, response from the White House to diversify um, the source of the diagnostics. And so it meant that through the better part of February, we had a virus introduced and circulating in the United States that we clearly had no idea where it was, who it was infecting, uh, just how prevalent it was, and it left us extraordinarily vulnerable. We don't have enough tests today uh, to meet uh, what we anticipate will be the demand going forward. Anybody right now and yesterday, anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there, and the tests are all perfect. As is known now, the tests that were out in the field, uh, one third of them, I believe, uh, were flawed and were coming back with false negatives. So that the very early part of spread, we did not have a way to understand what was happening with that spread. People are saying that they can't get tested even when they have symptoms. People are saying that they, doctors are telling us they don't have access to, to vital equipment. Can you explain that, that gap? Uh, well, I can't. I I cannot explain a gap. I'm hearing very good things on the ground, and we're dealing with love. They had to ramp up. They had an obsolete system, and they had a system simultaneously that was not meant for this. It wasn't. I got to give President Trump a, a great deal of credit. I, I think he's done a lot of a lot of positive. I just think that things move very rapidly when you're dealing with with diseases and viruses. Just I wish the tests would have been handled sooner and and better. I can't fault anybody for that. Very uncomfortable. It has to go all the way in there, dear, for about a minute. I'm sorry. You can close your window, buddy. Ayn Amjad, a doctor in Beckley, West Virginia, set up her own testing site. She says there was nowhere else nearby to send her patients. I do think we should have more tests. I don't understand how a country like the United States doesn't have that capability. I couldn't test myself right now. I couldn't test any family member right now unless I lied on that questionnaire. I couldn't test any staff member right now because we don't fit the criteria. So you know you have to self-quarantine yourself until you get the results. Tech. On March 11th, the coronavirus was declared a global pandemic by the World Health Organization. There are now more than 118,000 cases in 114 countries and 4,291 people have lost their lives. In a primetime address, the president struck a different tone. My fellow Americans, tonight I want to speak with you about our nation's unprecedented response to the coronavirus outbreak that started in China and is now spreading throughout the world. This is the most aggressive and comprehensive effort to confront a foreign virus in modern history. When Trump was asked by journalist Bob Woodward what had changed his approach, his answer was revealing. It's clear just from what's in on the public record that you went through a pivot on this to, oh my God, the gravity is uh, almost inexplicable and unexplainable. Well, I think, Bob, really, to be honest with sure, you... Sure, I want you to I be. wanted to... Uh, I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down. Yes, sir. Because I don't want to create a panic. Four zero headed to North Central Bronx for the code red. Has she been out of the home in the past two weeks? Everything's positive. But by now, the severity of the crisis was undeniable. There's a recognition of our interdependence that requires of this moment that we direct a statewide order for people to stay at home. Today I'm issuing a stay home, stay safe executive order for all Michiganders. And it goes As the country went into lockdown, it would endure the largest economic collapse since the Great Depression. Tens of millions were abruptly out of work. Whole industries stared down bankruptcy and small businesses struggled to hang on. In seven years of running the company, one of the things that I was most proud of is I never, never, never laid anybody off. And we added to benefits, didn't decrease them. And I never cut anybody's wage. And in that day in March, I did all those things. And that's hard. It's hard with a group of people you really care about to 
to do that? I think the biggest challenge has been the fact that the states and localities have been essentially left to figure this out so much on their own. This is our ED. You can see all the rooms are filled. Usually, In March, New York became the epicenter of the crisis. At Mount Sinai in Queens, there were patients in the hallways. We're trying our best to treat everyone that we can. All these patients here, even though we're overflowing, we're trying our best to still provide them care, which we are doing. I mean, it's the things that I see in the ER are scary. Um, I'm a little scared myself. Is oxygen level way too low? Does he have? He's corona positive. In Yonkers, paramedics were working at a grueling pace. This changed everything for us. So we did a month's worth of cardiac arrests in a 24-hour period. We did three months, four months worth of intubations in a 24-hour period. If people saw some of the things that we see on a daily basis, they wouldn't want to go outside. They would follow those social distancing rules. Across the country, hospital beds were filling up, and health workers were running out of personal protective equipment. The Obama administration would have invested in the strategic stockpiles, and if Trump would have, we would have had plenty of respirators, plenty of masks, plenty of uh, gloves, plenty of uh, ventilators. All of those things were in the plan, and plenty of beds for any surge capacity. In the ICU, we've been Rounding with one N95 mask for all of our COVID positive patients. You know, you saw these images in, in March and April of healthcare workers having to reuse N95 masks for the entire day or for days on end, just not having the basic equipment they needed to protect themselves. I think it's hard to be part of this response and not be complicit in some way. I think it's very hard to be in a situation like this when you have someone at the very top who is focused solely on what benefits him. The president was saying this was going to go away. It's April. It is going to go away. But Mr. President, it's you said it was going to go away in it's April. You said when it warmed up in April. I said it's going away, and it is going away. Yes. But, at nightly briefings by the coronavirus task force, Trump was often at odds with his own scientists. In states with evidence of community transmission, bars, restaurants, food courts, gyms, and other indoor and outdoor venues where groups of people congregate should be closed. So, Mr. President, are you telling, Mr. President, are, are, you telling, are you telling governors in those states then to close all their restaurants? Well, their we haven't bars? said that yet. Why we're not? recommending, but, but we're recommending things. No, we haven't gone to that step yet. That could happen, but we haven't gone there yet, please. One of the more memorable press conferences was at the end of April when the president pontificated about, you know, whether bleach, uh, if people injected bleach and UV rays, um, you know, whether that could rid the body of the virus. So supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light, and I think you said that hasn't been checked, but you're going to test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that, too. Sounds interesting. We'll the right, folks who could. right, and then I see the disinfectant, where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or? I remember watching this on the TV, and I think, I mean, I was shocked. I remember, my, I think my mouth fell open. By your comments about injections of disinfectant, they're, they're quite provocative. No, I was asking a question sarcastically to reporters like you just to see what would happen. But in the back of my head, what really worried me is some people are actually going to go do that because they listen to him. Maryland's Emergency Management Agency says they received about 100 calls today on disinfectant use. Even the CDC weighed in, tweeting this picture and saying, quote, Household cleaners and disinfectants can cause health problems when not used properly. But you actually saw the, these daily press briefings come to an end, 
after that one because it was so disastrous that the president had pushed that from the White House podium. I can't underscore enough in a crisis, consistency matters, steadiness matters. People are frightened. When people are frightened, what they want is somebody that gives them com comfort and confidence. And I think that was a lost opportunity in this pandemic. For all the confusion, the lockdown strategy was working. I think we ought to give Americans, as a people, credit. We ought to give ourselves credit for what we're accomplishing. An entire country shut down its economy, worked at home, didn't go to school, canceled traditions, events, seasons, in order to, in a unified way, respond to this threat. When you look at the admissions, the hospitalizations, the intensive care, and the need to intubate, that not only is flattened, it's starting to turn the corner. So that's what we're hopeful. And, and it's, you know, cautious optimism. That we but the experts that. were clear, the crisis was not yet over. Unfortunately for us, we still are in the first wave. On April 16th, Dr. Fauci and Ambassador Burks stood in the White House briefing room and from the White House podium said, here's the plan to reopen America. There needs to be 14 days of consecutive decrease. There needs to be multiple steps. There needs to be a whole process. This is a rather robust uh, program for re-entering into normality. The day after that, the president tweeted, it's time to liberate Michigan. It's time to liberate Minnesota. In Michigan, armed protesters barged into the state capitol building, and across the country, masks became a political symbol. When George Floyd was saying, I can't breathe, and then he died, and now we're wearing a mask, and we say, I can't breathe, but we're being forced to wear it anyway. And by the way, CDC and NIH didn't have their finest moments. We were, masks were useless, then masks were essential. The virus lasted for days on a surface, and then maybe it only lasted hours. Both the politicians were at odds with the science. And then when you added to that that the science sort of got, was, was putting out conflicting messages, I think Americans lost confidence in the science. You tweeted, in all caps, seriously, people, stop buying masks. You said they were not effective. Do you regret saying that? Science is about giving the best recommendations you can, yes. and when you learn more, you change those recommendations. Our recommendations... Well, masks, I think, are the first um, big issue that became politicized. And it's because the president uh, said you don't need to wear them and, and refused to wear them. Studies, the CDC is advising the use of non-medical cloth face covering as an additional voluntary public health measure. So it's voluntary. You don't have to do it. They suggest it for a period of time, but uh, this is voluntary. I don't think I'm going to be doing it. But you can't you have a lot of say things like that when you're the president. This crisis is real. The virus is real. People are dying. It, it took until the summer to, to actually finally see him wear one in public. And that's, you know, the, the, those are powerful messages. You, people, you, when you see the president doing or acting a certain way on TV, that's sort of an indication to people of, what they should be doing. In case you guys didn't hear, Governor Inslee, in his infinite wisdom, has decided after over 100 some odd days that we should all wear face masks inside and out. Here's, here's what I say. Don't be a sheep. No longer the case that there's medical advice, it's that there's red medical advice and blue medical advice. He may have taken it seriously behind closed doors at times, but we needed him to take it seriously publicly. And that would have been the game changer, I think, on where we are today. In late May, the country reached a once unthinkable milestone, 100,000 deaths. In Chicago, Myra Forbish lost her husband. People are taking the virus so lightly and they don't understand the impact that it has on so many people. They don't realize the impact that it has on the person dying alone in the hospital. If you look at 
effective communication in a crisis. And, and you think through some of the examples of recent presidents, you think through you know, Ronald Reagan after the Challenger incident. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. We saw you know, the 9-11 George W. Bush standing on the pile of rubble at ground zero. I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people, and the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. If you think about President Obama after the Charleston shooting. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. They were effective, they rallied. They provided a way for the country to process the grief that it was feeling. And I think the country is looking for a way to process the grief that it's feeling still. Yes, has Trump given us any of that? No. A massive government aid package was keeping the economy afloat, but for many, help was slow to arrive. When A.J. Sylvester lost his job in D.C., he and his wife Rosalind faced hard choices. I was actually thinking that we might need to sell the double stroller before we move. We'll have an easier time finding a buyer here. I mean, if we found a buyer for it, it'd be nice to have that little bit of extra money right now. <laughs> When the unemployment checks just weren't coming, the stimulus package money, we don't know when it'll start. And we only have two months that we can get a deferment on our loans and the credit cards, and then we owe everything still every month. And we don't have it. What are we going to do when those payments come due again? And the answer is that we sell our house and we move someplace else and start all over. By Memorial Day, some states were reopening with Trump's encouragement. Uh, certain states are going to have to take a little more time in getting open. And they're doing that. Some states, I think, frankly, aren't going fast enough. I mean, so there was a shift in the president where he then starts to criticize states for not opening. But the problem with that is that the virus was still not under control. We usually get here between 6 and 6.15. There is a line around the building every day. This is new. This has been probably within the last week, week and a half. It's alarming, to say the least, right now. Our ICUs are full. You saw southern states um, and some states in the west that decided to not really abide by the federal guidelines for reopening and just, you know, forge ahead, have these huge outbreaks over the summer. Three of the worst hit states, that's California, Texas, and Florida, have each recorded their highest daily death tolls yet. And there is growing evidence that the surge is linked to the reopenings. Tony? Yeah, and much of America. I saw Dr. Burks wake up at four o'clock in the morning every day before a task force meeting. I saw her work really hard and she did her best with the data team that she had. She would present the data and at times she would get pushback. She would get pushback by senior politicals in the room. Sometimes they would walk in with their own data. People would hear it, but they certainly didn't want that message to carry out to the public because it would be counterproductive on going back to a sense of normalcy or everything's, everything's okay, everything's fine. We've done a great job, crisis is over, let's move on. It's campaign season. I've heard people say, can we just get back to the campaign? Thank you, Oklahoma. As cases surged to new highs across the nation, the president returned to the campaign trail. His stock and trade is the big rally, the big, boisterous, crowded, long rally. And we could see that he was just itching to restart that part of his re-election campaign. Here's the bad part. When you test, of, when you do testing to that extent, you're going to find more people, you're going to find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. In Tulsa, campaign workers removed stickers encouraging social distancing. 
The president appeared without a mask, along with thousands of his supporters. Let's open the schools, please. Open. You saw the president badger the CDC this summer over its reopening guidelines for schools, saying it was way too difficult and expensive, and then you saw them have to rework that guidance. Yeah, the president has said um, unmistakably that he wants schools to open, and I was just in the Oval talking to him about that, and when he says open, he means open and full, kids being able to attend each and every day at their school. Uh, the science should not stand in the way of this. It's not normal for the CDC to have to run every single guidance through the White House. Their job is to give scientific facts and give guidelines. And instead, I saw internally the influence that people with no scientific backgrounds or medical backgrounds could have on some of these documents. In late July, Olivia Troy says she quit her job in protest. The White House would later claim she was fired. I had my own grieving to do about what I'd seen happen to families. I've seen friends affected by this virus, and I just couldn't live with it, knowing this. And I felt like now is the time. A thousand Americans are dying a day. They are dying, that's true. And you ha it is what it is, but that doesn't mean we aren't doing everything we can. It's under control as much as you can control it. This is a horrible plague that beset us. You really think this is as much as we can control? 200,000 dead, as you said, over 7 million infected in the United States. We, in fact, have 5%, 4% of the world's population, 20% of the deaths. If we would have listened to you, the country would have been left wide open. Millions of people would have died, not 200,000. And one person is too much. It's China's fault. It should have never happened. They stopped it. At the first presidential China's debate, fault. Trump defended his handling of the pandemic and mocked his opponent for following CDC guidelines. But I Just wear masks rally. when needed. When needed, I wear masks. OK, let me ask. I don't, have to, I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking. 200 feet away from it, he shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. It just seemed indicative of the way the president has approached this issue from the start, which is to ignore the science. Later in that week, everybody awoke to this headline that the president and the first lady had tested positive for the coronavirus. Not since when President Reagan was shot in an assassination attempt nearly 40 years ago has there been this level of concern over a president's health. That night, the president was flown to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. His supporters gathered outside. There was enough concern on the part of the doctors that they gave him a, a battery of, of drugs and then some steroids. And he had gotten treatment that no other American would have been able to get. So uh, it's been a very interesting journey. I learned a lot about COVID. I learned it by really going to school. This is the real school. This isn't the let's read the book school. And I get it, and I understand it. The next day, Trump made a triumphant return to the White House. He gets out of Marine One, and he walks up a stairway to a balcony at the White House, rips off his mask, tucks it in his pocket uh, in, a, in a kind of defiant way, and then stands there. You know, it's the reality TV president staging a reality TV event to say, I'm strong, I'm back, I'm healthy. And one thing that's for certain, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. We are still in the middle of a dangerous virus. It has not been contained. People continue to contract it. People continue to be hospitalized. People continue to die from this. And yet, the President of the United States continues to act as if it is mostly in the rearview mirror. I think for all of us who have been at this for so long, to look, look now at absolute horror, it, what isn't happening now? And there are people who've spent lifetimes planning for this and know exactly what to do. But I think the country is entitled to know after a tragedy of this magnitude, what have we learned, what can we do better, and what do we need to improve our capability and our response the next time. 
this has rocked America to its to its heels. It's rocked us pretty badly, and we're not out of it completely yet. It was, it's going to take a long time to recover, and it would have been so much better to be prepared 